today we're going to be cooking. yesterday in Peterborough. It is called the Agave Imperial. Fairly new place. It is a Mexican restaurant. Fairly new. Uh, the, the server's name was Josh and he immediately brought us into, you know, we told him what we do and he immediately started talking to us about, hey Aaron's here, welcome, about uh, tequila. And the tequila he used was, I don't know if I got it right, I think it's a Comodoro? Yes, that's the one he used. It was delicious. It may have been the best margarita I've had in many, many years. It was warm. It was round. It was more of an orange flavor than that uh, lime flavor, although he said there was no orange in it other than the triple sec. Today we are going to be using a Cointreau in our margarita. And a Cointreau triple sec Pretty similar, pretty similar. So yes, it is Year of the Rabbit, and uh, we're not going to be making any food that goes along with that culture, but we do appreciate that it is a very big celebration, and we do wish all of those people in that are celebrating a wonderful time of it. I'm going to put a little bit of lime juice in the dish, uh, in, the, in our glass. I'm gonna, <laughs> guess what I did? Yeah. Uh, you see what I did. I salted, uh, uh, put ice in it. That's okay. I can do it like this. We're going to salt the rim. Mmm, you can smell the lime on the ice. I love putting the lime right on the ice. It seems to flavor it in a different way. We're going to start off. We salted the rim a bit. We are going to start off with some pomegranate juice. So I hope everyone is uh, enjoying our gray weather today. I don't know where you're at, but it's gray in the Kawartha Lakes, but it's always bright and sunny in this kitchen. <laughs> We're gonna put about a cup and a half of pomegranate juice in our shaker. I think that's about it. We might have to top it up a bit. We're going to put, uh, we don't have the kind of tequila they use at Agave Imperial, but we do have um, this one. Tequila, I'm not that well versed in it, so it all tastes good. I'm going to put um, one shot per drink. We are celebrating so much today. You know, when I was a teacher, I had to keep a day plan, and I never thought I'd ever get to having to keep a day plan again, yet here we are. Uh, I've, I've got some things happening. I've got lots of people starting to notice our farm tours, and we're enjoying those. Uh, farmers are taking a bit of a break right now. And uh, they're, they're heading more towards spring when things start to really pick up. So uh, it's really starting to get busy. That's good. I put a half a shot of Cointreau. It's a little bit more orangey than triple sec, but we like that. Uh, you, you live in a small town, you go to the LCBO and you say, I need some triple sec. And they may have it, they may not have it. This particular time, they didn't have it. I'm going to give that a nice shake. So exciting thing about the restaurant that we visited in Peterborough yesterday is that once we started talking to them, they said, hey, why don't you come and... Hey, Dana's Kitchen's here. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, so Agave Imperial invited us to come back for a day and interview the chefs and test out their menu. We're looking forward to that. We're just finalizing that day because everybody schedules. So we are going to be going there and bringing that experience to you. Oh, tried to give a shout out to Dana. Apparently 
It's not working. Uh, did you put a space? Ah. We'll try it again. I like a little, you know, I like a little club soda. I'm going to put a little piece of lime in it. Dana's Kitchen is, uh, I, I really need to have a t chance to chat with Dana. I always mess up that command, he does. I'm going to uh, garnish it a little bit with some, yeah, really yummy. You know, nothing like runaway pomegranate seed. Nothing like pomegranate this time of year. We were talking about when we were kids, this used to be uh, a, a Saturday night treat, and we'd open it up, crack it open, and we'd each get one and just destroy our shirts, destroy our face. Somehow that really tasted good. Now, if you use the overhead and look at this, this is a really picture-perfect drink. It gives you the feeling of uh, summer is coming. So we'll give one to the producer, even if he doesn't deserve it. And let's see what we did. I can hear margarita. The front camera should be on. This is delicious. I'm busy. It is a margarita. Is that what you just said? It doesn't taste like margarita. Doesn't taste like margarita? Well, the pomegranate juice is, uh, juice is a little bit sweeter. Cheers, everybody. Let's get going on our cooking. I'll remove this. So that, oh, I'm trying to get rid of that word, by the way. If you hear me say it today, you get to reprimand me in the chat. That word is coming out of my vocabulary. I know why it's there. It was a way in the classroom to uh, jolt the kids back in, to draw them back in. Uh, we are big margaritas. Speakeasy Channel is on our, in our chat right now. They are our, our associate affiliate channel. If you can go over and give them a follow, give Dana's Kitchen a follow too, although she doesn't need it. She's got millions. We were talking about the margaritas. Speakeasy Channel loves margaritas. Their large marge are a part of all of their Friday night streams. We love them too. Whenever we go anywhere to treat ourselves, we always say, let's have a margarita. Gazillions is right. Dana's Kitchen needs to share some with me. Love watching her. And I watch Dana's Kitchen. And I'm going to tell you this, Dana. I watch it. <laughs> I watch it to say, what is she doing that does this? And I'm, I'm watching you. I'm, I'm watching you. So we're going to start off with a banana cream pie. The reason I am starting it first is because I want to assemble the whole dish. While we're cooking today, I have so many fun things to talk to you about. So many fun things that this stream is starting to uh, accumulate in projects. We, are going, we have got some projects coming up this spring that really excite us, give us some motivation. Let's get into our, our cake. A Boston cream pie, what is it? You know, I could call it a Boston cream cake. Now, if you're in the chat and you know me well, you know that I'm a Boston Bruins fan. This cake or pie has nothing to do with that the Boston Bruins are in the top of the NHL league right now. Nothing to do with that at all. I just thought it was a nice cake to make. It is one of our favorites here. When when we were uh, younger, there was this kit, and if you're a cook in the, or you're just an eater in this chat, you might remember these kits. These kits came with all three components. And tell me if you remember ever seeing these. They were good. Uh, they tasted delicious. They were easy to make because you had all the component, components there. They seemed to always be in my pantry as a kid, and I could cook it. They were yummy, and then when you learn to make your own, you realize that was really just, you know, akin to a Pillsbury croissant to a real one. They're good. They're not the real thing. So we're going to make the, that's it. I did it. You could reprimand me in the chat. We are going to make that cake today. It starts off with a really simple yellow cake. Nice, tender. Now this is a this is a cake you want to make if you've got a glut of eggs in your fridge or you find them on sale because the entire thing, by the time you make the two yellow cakes, the pastry cream that goes in the middle, 
the ganache doesn't take eggs. By the time you make the two components of this, other than the topping, you've used 10 eggs. So, ah, if you have, I'm really getting rid of it today. Today is the anti so stream. If you have those eggs, whoops, I just moved my mixer. Uh, this is what you want to make, or a custard. What is pastry cream? Pastry cream is a, a, an egg yolk cream that is used as a filling or a center. It's not a cream like you would eat like a pudding. It is an egg yolk base that's a little bit stronger. It's delicious and you've had it. You've had a Boston cream donut and you've had it. Let's start off with our cake. We start off with 10 tablespoons of unsalted softened butter. Did you put that music on? And the next thing we're going to put in uh, is one and a half cups of sugar. I could be using, this is new for me, this, this chute and guard that goes on my KitchenAid. I think I like it. Uh, this is a first, this is like its first voyage, so we'll see. And then we're going to put in three large egg yolks. <laughs> I'm not using it yet. And then three full eggs. So it's mostly the yolk. We're looking for that warmth and that tenderness and that crumb that comes from the egg yolk. Three egg yolks and three full eggs. If you want to put the recipe up for the Boston cream pie, you'll see also that we're going to be doing uh, a lemon rosemary spatchcock chicken. That's up there. We'll come back to it. Thanks so much, Dana, for uh, showing up today. I know, oh, Leafy Greens is here, welcome. Leafy Garnish? Oh, I'm sorry, Leafy Garnish, I'm sorry. Uh, I saw you on my Instagram and I've been reading that wrong for all this time. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the chat. Uh, my name's Connie Powers, if you don't know that. I am a culinary content creator and we make delicious home baked goods. I'm going to mix this butter, sugar, and eggs. That's how you start a basic soft cake, isn't it? If you want to put this camera on so they can see inside. We just made a nice pomegranate margarita for our drink o'clock. It's yummy. You want to get the butter, sugar, and eggs, three egg yolks, three large eggs. You want to get that really nice and incorporated together, a really nice light egg yolk mixture. You know, I left my butter out all night, but my kitchen's a little cool. My cupboard, you know, that's what's the problem with countertops that are granite like this. It, it's a little cool, and so the butter wasn't as soft as I should have had it. That'll all come together, though, when we mix the uh, dry ingredients. In the meantime, I'm gonna slow this down. Let that butter soften in there. In the meantime, we want to, we'll go here. We want to get our dry ingredients ready. So I have two and a half cups of cake and pastry flour. Important to use that. This is a tender, tender cake. And if you've had this, you know, it has to be that soft yellow cake that just melts in your mouth. Uh, we have two and a half cups of cake flour. We have one and a half teaspoons of baking powder and one half teaspoon of salt, not very much in this. We're gonna mix that together. Use a whisk. So let's see, we have uh, leafy garnish in the chat today. We have Dana's Kitchen. I know that Speakeasy is there. I have a feeling we might be up on their big screen in their studio. It's a busy studio with lots of streaming going on, uh, lots of graphic artists in the place today, and they love us. We like them? Of course. Yes, yes, of course. Okay, yes, the, the word is in. Yes, we like them too. In fact, we would not be here if it wasn't for Lizzie from Speakeasy Channel. She's the one who helped us get designing and get going. 
All right, I'm going to shut that down because it's beautiful. It's a beautiful golden color. Let's put my new guard on. Let's see if this even works. Now, here's what you want to do. You want to have your dry ingredients. And if you've made a cake in your life, you know that you alternate between dry and wet ingredients. I've got one cup of buttermilk. Can you beat buttermilk in a soft yellow or white cake? No. I am going to put in, uh, I think it's two. I have to check because I don't know about you. I am not one of those cooks or streamers that just has the recipe in the top of my head. I don't care to. Two tablespoons of neutral oil. Put it right into the buttermilk. By neutral oil, I've just got a, a vegetable oil here. Meaning, don't use olive oil here. And a little bit of vanilla, a tablespoon and a half. Uh, if you have your own vanilla, bonus for you. I did follow, yay, Dana followed Speakeasy. It's an edgy kind of, uh, it's an edgy kind of entertainment. I love it, it's my Friday night go-to. They make me laugh. Thanks for that follow. That might be why you are such a happening girl. Because you are ready for anything. I get Dana's Kitchen more and more every day. All right, put my vanilla over here. We're gonna take my tender little tiny whisk. <laughs> and I am going to mix this buttermilk, neutral oil, and vanilla up. There, I have got the components to start mixing. Are you ready? We are going to start off with the flour. Here's my new shoot. Let's go on this so they can watch the shoot being used. Yeah, uh, uh, nice. All right, you're going to put a third of your dry ingredients in. I'm careful when I make a cake. I'm not, I just don't want a tough crumb. A little bit, oh, I like this shoot. I have stopped myself from buying this for so many years and cleaned up my mess from all of the spraying. I'm going to put another third, and if you, if you know this well, you know that you should end with wet ingredients. Nice, I'm going back and forth between dry and wet ingredients, and I'm going to put in the remaining part of my dry ingredients, which is two and a half cups of flour, a tablespoon and a half, I think, put that recipe back up, of uh, baking powder, and a little bit of salt. Okay, shoot so far is a win. I'm glad I bought it. And I'm going to end that with the rest of the wet ingredients, which is buttermilk, neutral oil, and vanilla. Nice, it smells good. Uh, my buttermilk is on the edge, and if you know what I mean, not extremely fresh, doesn't have to be. Buttermilk is already yucky. You can use it for anything. Okay, I like it. I like what it looks like. We're going to take the shield off and we're going to prepare our pans. I want you to use two eight inch or nine inch pans, eight inches best two cake pans. Now, if you look, I have got these parchment lifters. These are ideal. You can make a sling, a different kind of sling with parchment paper if you don't have this. My grandfather used to drink buttermilk for breakfast. Don't we all have that grandfather or that? I had a mother-in-law, uh, it's Speakeasy's grandmother, who used to drink buttermilk on a hot summer day and just say, oh, there's nothing more refreshing. I suppose I suppose that would be, I couldn't bring myself to do it, it's thick. But I could drink a yogurt drink. So what's the difference? You know what happens with this drink? I'm just gonna let you know. You go to take a sip of it and the mm -hmm. pomegranate sticks in the straw. Have you noticed that? Yeah, it just has a bowl on it. <laughs> okay, that's your own preference. Uh, I have noticed something else since I've got a couple streamers. I prefer coffee or mimosas. Yeah, we do too. Uh, I have got a couple of streamers in the chat. I want to bring to your attention that uh, lately, you know, I've been looking at the analytics. We all do. We say, don't look at them, but we do. 
And uh, I've been noticing that Twitch is sending me uh, by gender. They're saying you've got this many females and this many, or says women, and this many men. And I'm like, hey, Twitch, what up with that? <laughs> There's only two genders? Like, what, what, what's happening, Twitch? How about all of my community who represent another demographic? So how do they even know? I know this because how these, the, the names in the chat don't, don't say anything. So Leafy Garnish is on here. That does not tell me. And do I need to know gender? Is, is, my, is my stream any more valuable because I have more women? or more men, I think my stream is more valuable because of the genders that they don't mention. My stream is populated by all. And this is an inclusive and safe space, so everybody's welcome. Now, I, I, you notice that I greased my pans. This is a tender cake. I'm also going to uh, just put a little spritz on top of the parchment. I'm not taking any chances, but you'll also know that I have got a real advantage with these parchment lifts. I got them on Amazon, easy to find, and you don't use them often, but when you do, you think, wow, these are great. All right, let's put our batter in. My butter didn't mix up entirely. It was a little bit, is it gonna ruin my cake? Absolutely not. Now, you know how, the KitchenAid's work. There's always the pocket underneath. Yeah, I'm not too impressed. Now, what can you do if your butter isn't entirely melted and you think, oh no, you can set this entire thing into a little bit of hot water into your sink. Set the whole thing. In a few minutes, you're going to have all your butter softened. This cake, it won't matter. It does not matter if I have that. So I'm going to evenly divide the batter best way is to uh, measure, you use a weigh scale. You can see I'm not doing that. Uh, let me get a, here it is. Let me get my spatula. I think this one got shortchanged a little bit. I'm going to eyeball it. <clears throat> so some of the fun things we have coming up, uh, we are going to be going, did I say so? Remember, if you hear me say so, you get to reprimand me in the chat. Yeah, just put it in a little bit of hot water or set it on your hot cooktop if you've got that sort of thing. I don't because I have induction. But you just set it right in the kitchen sink, a little bit of hot water, and the metal bowl of your KitchenAid will heat it up. Let's put these in the oven. They do not cook long. We're going to set it for... Is that Bruiser? Yes. I, you know what? I still have a hard time seeing my chat. Bruiser, welcome. Bruiser is a full chef. Italian chef, we love it when they show up. Welcome, we're making a Boston cream pie today. So I'm gonna set these in the oven at 350. I'm going to set my oven for about 25 minutes, not very long. Okay, so I've got it set for 25 minutes. That's all set. And I'm going to go through how I made the pastry cream. I'm not making it here today because pastry cream, as Bruiser will tell you, pastry cream should be made the day before. It's imperative. Classic. I know it's a classic. It has nothing to do with the Boston Bruins being the, in the top of the NHL league. It's nothing to do with that. <laughs> and it's nothing to do with the fact that Tom is a Maple Leafs fan. It's not their year. I licked the salt. We're having a pomegranate margarita. I'm in no hurry today, so if you are, uh, you might want to watch, go away, come back. I'm taking it easy today. Mm. I have got pomegranate seeds in here, and they are a pain in the ass. All right, let's talk about the pastry cream. Bruiser, let me know if this is how you, hey, Andrea's here, woo! Oh, I said no more woo. <laughs> <laughs> no more woo and no more so. If I say woo or so, you get to reprimand me. You get to call me a bad name in the stream. 
what would you call me? <laughs> Woo is good though. Woo, is it good? I don't know. But if you're in the stream and I do a woo, or I do a so, you get to call me a bad name. So, woo, well, listen, I'm not doing it because I'm not giving Bruiser the opportunity to call me a bad name. Okay, we have another project. I've told you about Agave Imperial, fun, fun restaurant, and we get to go, Bruiser, listen to this, we get to go interview the authentic Mexican chefs. And, and, and they know what they're talking about. <laughs> Bruce, I would never. No, Andrea, you would never as well. Uh, we get to go interview those chefs. Exciting. That might take a whole new turn for us. I love doing the farm tours, but thinking about talking to other chefs and other foodies is so exciting. I, like Bruce and I have met up once or twice, and when we meet up, all we do is talk about food. Foodies talk about food, and you exclude other people who don't want to talk about it because you want to talk about how much salt goes on something and, and, and what kind of salt you used. It matters. Here's the pastry cream. You can see overhead, please, you can see how nice this pastry cream worked. Sounds difficult to make, so simple. I just put the, I'm going to go just double check my recipe. I put in egg yolks. Here, I, I made this amount made for egg yolks one cup of milk, half a cup of sugar, half a teaspoon salt, and one and a half tablespoons of cornstarch. There's no special thing. You put it all into a pot, you whisk the hell out of it, and six to seven, uh, eight minutes, you whisking it, and you think that's not gonna work. It works, and then you take it off when it bubbles, it's thickened, and you put in two tablespoons of butter and a little bit of vanilla. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Eight minutes of my time, my valuable time. <laughs> make, make pastry cream the day ahead. It is so simple, and I do have the recipe on that card that Tom is going to put up now. So, do, ah, damn it, I used it again. Don't call me a bad name. If I catch it, you have to catch it without me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm looking at it close because I can't see. I can't see shit anymore. So you saw the pastry cream, it's egg yolks, it's sugar, it's milk, it's salt, it's vanilla. Take it off, put some butter in it, and boom! The next day you have got pastry cream. We have two yellow cakes cooking, pastry cream is done. Now what do we need to top this cake? Come on, Bruiser, you know this. We need a nice chocolate ganache. And that sounds like exercise. <laughs> ganache, baby! Yes, we need ganache. I am going to show you a home-cooked version of ganache. Now, you can heat your cream, and you can do it that way with a, with a bain-marie. I have made ganache like this, shiny, glossy, rich ganache. That's what we're looking for. I have made ganache like this my entire life, all 50 years of it. I have made this ganache. You have to have about two cups, for this recipe, you need about two cups of dark chocolate. You can use the best, you can use the cheapest. I go middle of the road. Nobody here notices, nobody here mentions. I can use top end chocolate and everybody scarfs it the same way if I used Hershey's Chippets. <laughs> so I have two cups of a dark chocolate that you can chop or you can use some uh, chips. What's that name? That is it Ghirardelli? What is that? Come on, I, I, Bruiser, you know it's an Italian thing. It, that's a good chocolate, and that's what this is. Not the best, but not the cheapest. I put this, and I put one cup of whipping cream. And here's the magic. You do this, and then I'm going to put it into my microwave for one minute. Uh, Dana and I were talking about the disaster your kitchen becomes when you stream. You know what, I'm such a neat freak that it gets on my nerves. Let's put this in the microwave for one minute.
So I have the cakes in the oven, the pastry cream made, and the ganache microwaving. How destroyed are you, Bruiser, that I put the ganache in the microwave? How destroyed is that? I think it's great. I get in a kitchen zone, not at all. Good, good, good. I'm glad to know because it's the way I'm doing it. Let's look at our cakes. They look nice. They look nice. So some people make one yellow cake, cut it in half and make a Boston cream pie like that. I usually do lower power, like 70% for stuff like that. Ooh, that's a good idea. I never even change the power. Do you ever, who changes the power on their microwave? I push a button, I go. Who changes the power on their microwave other than Bruiser? I think this is where Bruiser stands alone. <laughs> no one changes the power on the microwave. What happened? Did I get ganache out of this? Let's see. Eh, you don't know anything? producer look did I get it overhead please mm, gotta stir it now whisk that now of course you have to hey it's a god save it's a god save good save for softening butter it could be a god save too for softening butter and cream cheese when you need it uh, look I've got ganache happening so I didn't have to go 70%. I didn't have to do all of that stuff. I've got delicious, nutritious, fictitious. Look at that. Look at that. It's a beauty. If you are on the chat right now and you do like to follow streamers, please go follow Dana's Kitchen. She is in the chat right now. She doesn't need the follow, but I need to know that I did the right thing. Go follow her. All right, look at that, luscious, and it's going to melt within itself. So what have I got here? I've got yellow cakes in there. I've got, uh, yeah, it is a strong microwave. Um, it's all Bosch equipment that's in my kitchen. And uh, if I had to create another kitchen, I probably would not use Bosch again. And Bosch is probably gonna email me about that. Okay, I'm gonna set that aside because my pastry cream, let me put that on the overhead, my pastry cream and my ganache is now ready. It's cooling. We're going to set this aside on. That's one good point about the countertop is that it's cold. So those are ready to go. And I'm going to leave that now. You could finish the ganache with a knob of butter for extra shine and soft. I knew that. I would like a spoonful of that ganache. Okay, wait a minute. Leafy garnish ready. There you go. Yeah, it's all yours. <laughs> okay, drop by any time. Oh, oh, drop by any time. That's rude awakening over here. I'm going to put a little butter. Mmm, how was it? I'm going to put a little butter. I, you know what? I would prefer salted for this. And you know how I know that this is the butter bruiser? Because it says butter on it. That you know, I, I do that. When you get a little older, you have to label everything in your kitchen. Okay, I'm gonna put a little bit of butter in there because <clears throat> the chef online told me to. So will this keep it from going dull? Always salted, yes, always salted. Ew. Yeah. Okay, so it's melting in itself. Yep, that butter is in there. All right, setting it aside. Next thing I want to talk to you about is spices and herbs. And I'm so glad that you're all here to hear about this because go to your spice cabinet right now. Go to your cupboard right now and look at how old some of those are. I brought out my spices yesterday. And, you know, this is a good time of year to go through them. So here's what I have. I have these drawers that go into my cupboard. 
And uh, this is just two of them. I have four of them, and I didn't think it was necessary to bring them all out. So yeah, I have them labeled. You know, come, don't come at me for it. I have them labeled because, why not? I just purchased all the same jars, and I keep my spices in these jars, never plastic. And I label them because they, some of them look alike. So we'll go here. So how to uh, love this. This, I do have four more or two more drawers like this. So I have four drawers like this. But can you use all these spices? Not necessarily. So, you know, every few months, I, I just said so. As someone whose closet and drawers are color cord, yay, you're my kind of people. Uh, I've had a Costco job. <laughs> Okay, Bruiser, listen, um, the Costco size jug of cayenne, <laughs> are you kidding me? Six years, get rid of it. Man, get rid of it. It's, it's crap, you know that. I go through these every few years, every few months. Sorry, I thought I had more, more green and I don't. Every few months and I get rid of what I have not used. I know if I don't use it. So yesterday I pulled one out that said saffron. Listen, I lived in the Middle East for uh, almost a decade and saffron was something I used a lot. When I pulled this one out here, I thought, when did I get this? Yes, Dana's Kitchen even has a spreadsheet. I've seen it. She has her spices some that she uses all the time, some that she uses occasionally, and some that she has in storage. I'm going to tell you that that's how you do it. You buy them in a bag. You buy them in, do not buy the jars at the grocery store. You know, what are they? Six, seven dollars for a jar of it. Yes, you have the jar, but how long has that been sitting at the grocery store? So maybe it's not the best way to buy your spices. I buy them at a bulk place and I get them in a small amount. I don't mind if, like this is cream of tartar, okay? Cream of tartar is not going to go stale. It might, but it's not the one. Let's look at chili powder. I have this much chili powder. Now the chili powder I get is deadly because I get it from an imported, an Indian version of this chili powder. I don't use a lot of it. If the recipe calls for four teaspoons, I'm going to put in a quarter teaspoon. It'll kill anybody. Poultry seasoning. Who uses this? I don't know. I do sometimes in some stuffing. Let's look at fennel seed. Fennel seed is a whole spice, and this one will last you up to a year. <laughs> that amount of chili powder would only last about two weeks in my house. Well, this particular chili powder, and I do have a bag of it, but this particular chili powder is so hot that I reduce the use of it, and I'm never going to buy it again because it's actually too hot. And I know, Dana, you're from Texas, so I'm sure that it would only last you a little bit of time. I put fennel in my turkey meatloaf, so good. I put fennel in a, a bolognese. Okay, bruiser, come at me. I put fennel in a bolognese with some artichokes. It's delicious. We do love spicy. And because of Dana's Kitchen, I went out and bought this yesterday. Because of Dana's Kitchen, I went out and bought some fresh sumac. We are going to be making some kofta coming up and I needed this. <laughs> you always come for you. I, I, I always come for you. Come at me, bruiser. So the, f I just used the word so. Stop me. Stop me. Love sumac. Well, I do too. And I'm going to try and use it more. I'm going to start drawing back from the recipes I learned while well, I was in the Middle East, and I'm going to be starting to make uh, a lot more of those traditional recipes. I was a teacher there, and students would bring their recipes from their mom. I was invited into their homes, and I would learn how to cook their recipes. It was really a learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> Every time, I can't take a shot of tequila. <laughs> 
That's a good one. Uh, I could uh, take a sip of my margarita. A shot of tequila. We wouldn't get through my spatchcock chicken. Hey, speakeasy, are you here? I haven't heard you in the chat. So let's look at fennel seed. This one will last you for about a year because it's a whole spice. If you look at something like celery seed, this one may last you for a whole year because it hasn't been ground. Uh, let's look at something like cumin. In three to six months, this one has absolutely what your punishment is drinking your margarita. That does not. <laughs> I know it's one of those punishments a kid would give themselves. Uh, this cumin is ground. It will last you about three to six months. Throw it away. That's why you buy little bits or keep it in a separate sealed bag. You notice all my spices are in jars. We have a video of a chef. I was going to go on and on about spices as I am. We have a video of a chef who talks about spices. Do we still want to run that? Sure. Okay, we're going to listen to this chef tell you about spices. Today we're going to be learning about spices. How do you store them optimally? What spices should you pick up for your kitchen? And where should you buy them to save quite a bit of money? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Ethan, a home cooking nerd who likes to find better ways to cook and share them with all of you. Timestamps are in the YouTube play bar for all the various sections so you guys can check out and jump around. But first, let's start with a little bit of spice knowledge. From Harold McGee's On Food and Cooking, he describes herbs and spices as categories of plant materials used primarily as flavorings in relatively small amounts. Each spice has an aroma compound that gives it its characteristic flavor. The compound that makes fresh ground pepper smell and taste like fresh ground pepper versus the aroma compounds that make oregano smell and taste like oregano. Now typically we buy spices as whole or ground, and it actually makes a huge impact on the flavor life of each spice. Whole spices will keep well for a year or more, while pre-ground spices will start to degrade in flavor after just three to six months. You see, the spice compounds are highly volatile and reactive, meaning they will be altered when exposed to oxygen, moisture in the air, or energy sources like heat and direct light. When you compare ground versus whole spices, the fine particles of ground spices have a large surface area and lose their aroma molecules to the air much more rapidly. To test this, you can do a little experiment. Take a couple of peppercorns and give them a sniff. Now ground some fresh peppercorns and give that a sniff. The increased surface area should give off much more smell, but that's only while they are fresh ground. If you leave that pepper sit out in the open air for 24 hours, it won't be nearly as fragrant. Or if you've ever had ground pepper that's been in the cabinet for years, that stuff basically has no flavor left and this is your cue to throw out any old ground spices that have been hovering in the cabinet for the past several years. So now that we know a little bit about spices, it's easy to understand how to store them. In general, we want to stay from moisture, open air, heat, and light. So probably the worst possible place you could store your spices is in an open bowl right by the stove with a boiling pot of water and sunlight streaming down. A good place on the other hand to store them is in sealed containers in a dry environment away from extreme heat and direct light. Now the most optimum storage for maintaining flavor life would be an opaque glass container stored in the freezer and then you let that container warm to room temperature before opening to use the spice to prevent moisture from condensing. Now I don't know about you, but watching spice containers warm up while I'm trying to make dinner doesn't sound too exciting, so here's what I do. I bought 24 clear spice containers on Amazon and filled them up with my various spices. I went with the clear ones because I like the aesthetic. It's just fun to see all the vibrant colors, variations, and shapes. However, because I'm using clear bottles, I'll be storing them in the drawer. I bought a bamboo drawer insert that pops them up nicely and keeps them organized. I place these in the drawer to the left of my stove so I have easy access, but make sure they sit on the far left of the drawer so they don't get much, if any, ambient heat from when the oven and stove are in use. This way I can quickly grab my spices if I'm set up with my butcher block, doing prep work, or if I need to add something quickly at the stove. So we've got the storing down, but what about buying them? Because if you aren't careful, the spice dollars can really add up fast. The question of what spices you should buy is completely personal. For example, if you're really into Indian food, there are countless variations of spices you could potentially pick up. But if you only make Indian food from time to time, maybe you only wanna keep three to four core spices on hand, so they don't lose their flavor by the time you finally use them. 
For me, I've outlined this question in three buying categories for how I use these. Number one is absolute bare necessities. Number two is my top five used spices. And number three is the Pro Home Cooks kind of basic spice cabinet, which you can basically almost make anything. My absolute bare necessities are coarse kosher salt and black peppercorns. For purposes of cooking, salt is the most important ingredient for seasoning and enhancing the flavor of food, so I'm including it in this video even though technically it is a mineral and not a spice, meaning it's actually not going to lose flavor over time, and you just need to keep it dry, that's it. The first thing every cook should do is learn how to master salt and pepper. Salt alone is all that is needed to make amazing meals, and I'll link a couple of videos below that I've done about salting, but let's move to my top five spices. My top five used spices include cumin seeds, chili powder, turmeric, smoked paprika, and oregano. With just these five spices, I can make all sorts of dishes from Mexican cuisine, Indian cuisine, Italian, Mediterranean, and more. And if you're wondering why garlic powder is not on my top five list, it's because I prefer to use fresh garlic nine times out of 10, so I don't typically reach for garlic powder too often. Now let's add 11 more spices to what I'll call the Pro Home Cooks kind of basic spices. For me, these are bay leaves, garlic powder, sumac, dried dill, coriander seed, fennel seed, mustard seed, red pepper flakes, cinnamon stick, whole cloves, and cardamom pod. Adding these 11 spices, you can really transport your taste buds all across the globe with just a few pinches of that here and there. Now, even though these are the spices that I would say to pick up, I wouldn't suggest you run out and go get all 18 of them in one go as I did. Thankfully, this is a business expense. Instead, take a minute and think about what you wanna cook and maybe add an extra 10 to $15 to the grocery budget to pick up a couple spices. Speaking of, where is the best place to buy spices? Spices can quickly get expensive, especially if you're picking up those one ounce glass bottles at the grocery store that easily can run you six to $7 a piece. Multiply that by 18 spices and you were looking at well over $120. The first option is to find a store that sells spices in bulk so you can buy exactly how much you want and don't have to pay for the packaging. Another great and cheaper option that I've found allowed me to buy over 18 spices weighing over 80 total ounces and it only cost me $72. The secret, Google International Grocery Store near you. I've lived in various places along the east and west coast and have always had one within a 30 minute drive. And this one that I went to is actually only nine minutes away, so I'll be visiting much more often. They'll typically have a large selection of spices and bags and containers that are much, much cheaper than your typical big box grocery store. Additionally, you'll see a lot of cool stuff from snacks in the frozen section in the meat counter, so it's definitely one that you should just check out in the meantime. That was great. Uh, yeah, he has some great ideas. That's a great way to purchase, store, organize. You get the idea. Go to your kitchen cupboard right now. Dana, not so much, but the rest of you, go to your kitchen cupboard. Throw away your six-year-old cayenne from Costco. Just take stock. If you haven't used it, it's probably not necessary. The yellow cakes are just about ready to take out. We're going to take them out, we're going to cool them, and we're going to start talking about our spatchcock chicken. Spatchcock is a 17th century term that comes from spatch the cock, which means butterfly it, open the bird. Enough said about that. <clears throat> my my uh, cakes are going to come out, so I'm going to get some some cooling and we're going to shut that off shut that off i don't want to shut my bottom oven off though because that's where mm, let's see yep yeah, that's good we want these cakes tender we do not want them overcooked uh, also i want to bring to your attention thank you to speakeasy channel for the uh subscribe i believe that that said that we had that Speakeasy has subscribed for uh, 14 months, over a year. Thank you so much, Speakeasy. We have a new viewer. I can't see who it is. Maybe it is Texas Cryptid. Texas Cryptid is not a new viewer. They were on last week. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome back. So we are going to put... Yay, Dana's Kitchen. I believe Texas Cryptid is from Dana's Kitchen, and we welcome you. We made a pomegranate margarita, which is yummy. This is my second one. We uh, started off making uh, a 
Boston cream pie. We've made the yellow cakes and I'm going to put them, I have a, a cold room. Uh, it's a, it's a, <laughs> I don't know what's happening to my stream right now. It is a sunroom that is cold in the winter. It's perfect. It's like my walk-in cooler. I'm going to put these outside. That was supposed to be the producer's job, but that's not happening. <clears throat> I'm not there because I'm still putting them outside. All right, we're back. And though they are outside, it's rather cold in Ontario today. Uh, my Texas followers won't know that. But yes, we have, I would say, what, four below zero Celsius today. I don't know if that is in Fahrenheit. The rest of the world is... Celsius, I don't know. You got to figure it's it like out. 30-ish. 30 30-ish? 30 30 no, it's colder than that. 28. No snow. Is it snowing there? Uh, leafy Garnish, I don't know where you're from. I think you're from the GTA. Not snowing yet, but we're hoping so. Hamilton. Oh, I see. We love snow. We, we stand snow. We stand winter. It, it's it's our favorite thing. We are going to unbox our all clad roaster. It's a 13 by 16. I haven't taken it out yet, and I stopped myself from taking it out because I wanted to do it. It's 13 Celsius in my part of Texas. Oh, that's a little cold, a little chilly. Yeah, that's uh, that's a sw that's sweater weather. Sweater weather. I'm going to take this out first time, so we need the overhead on this. Producer is distracted. It's not in the right place. This is what I got from All Clad. You can see that it is, it has all of the packaging. I did not take this out. We're taking it out today. Let's go on the front one now so that we can see the whole thing. I'm taking it out. Oh, it has more packaging. Loud? Yeah, packaging is loud. The packaging's loud, so put the box over there. This is what we got. Time for a fire. Is that what you do when it, uh, yeah, can't complain. We don't drop below freezing very often. <laughs> Come visit us sometimes. Freezing is where we're at. I'm going to take away all the packaging. This is a beauty, my friends. This is a beauty. And who is this pan from your Insta? It is from, I think it, it is from my Insta, but I have, that would be a stock photo because I haven't unwrapped this. Yes, the packaging's loud. Oh, want this, gimme, no kidding. Uh, this is available on the All Clad site. It's also available from Amazon if you, t you know, if you want to. Uh, look at the, look at the inside. Can we do the overhead? Look at the inside of this, Bruiser, Bruiser. Are you just saying, what up, woman? This is gorgeous. I'm getting rid of packaging. I sh yeah, it's gorgeous. Uh, I'm going to wipe it out. We don't know where it's been. Uh, I'm three hours south of Dana. I live 10 years in northern Utah. Snow six months out of the year. Can't do that anymore. Good thing that I am a winter person. I love winter. I love deep snow. I love cold. I don't so much love the ice. And I used to live more southern Ontario and there was a lot of ice and no snow. And that just gets plain dangerous. Ice, ice baby is what it was in southern Ontario. I'm more central Ontario now and more northern central. And I do love it up here because uh, I noticed the other day we were talking about I think it was Dana, I was talking to her about Canada, and she said, my friend, and she pointed upwards, and yeah, I guess we are. So I'm gonna wipe this out. This is gorgeous. This was, uh, I do have a, a sponsorship from All Clad, and they sent me this and said, please use it, no problem. I can use this. You can keep it, what? Now it comes with this, Tremendous rack. 
And I can see this overhead so you can see the rack. I can, I can see this as being really valuable with a, a roast of beef. I can see this being really valuable with duck. Anything that you want to separate, even a, 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 a beef wellington would be beautiful. Today, though, I want it to be right on the base of the stainless steel. Look at the size of it. You can see my hand. You can see this is 13 by 16. They have a smaller one, and they asked me which one I thought that I would use more. This one is going to be beautiful for a turkey. Imagine you're roasting a turkey on this, and then you just have to lift it out. It, it's really something in my kitchen that I'm going to use. We're going to remove the rack and we are going to put a little bit of olive oil on the base. Oh, this is a brand new, and this is not Evo bruiser. This is just run of the mill olive oil. We are going to set that aside and we're going to start our spatchcocking. Now, if you notice, I have brought it on a, a separate cutting board. I don't cut my chicken on my wooden cutting board. That's just me. I don't want it to penetrate the cutting board. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this upside down. Now you notice I started it. What you want to do to spatchcock this is you want to cut the backbone out of it. You want to cut the spine out of this. I'm going to complete what I started. You need a very sharp knife to do this. So I'm removing the chicken backbone from this. This is what will I use this for? This is stock in the making. Put this into a stock pot, you put some uh, aromatics in it and you've got yourself a little pot of stock. You could even, if this hasn't been frozen before, you can even put this in the freezer and use it for another day. I will be using this. I want to put it someplace safe and I will make even a small pot of stock. I put it into ice cube trays and I've got a little bit of stock. What I've got now is a chicken ready to be butterflied. I flatten it out like this. Now you can see, I did one uh, earlier this week and I put it on my Instagram. I'm gonna cut that extra piece of fat off. Nobody needs that. What do I do? I always keep a hand free. One hand clean, one hand that I touch the chicken. So I'm going to be flattening this out, butterflying. And it's great, look at it, it's ready to go. If you want to go look at Three Forks Farm, please look at them on, uh, on their website. They deliver, even to the GTA, such nice product. All right, we have got the chicken nicely butterflied, set it aside. Now see how nice it is to have it on its own cutting board? You can remove it and you can make the next stage. I'm going to make a wet rub as opposed to a dry rub. And what's the difference? The wet rub is going to be using some olive oil and some minced garlic and some lemon juice, and I'm going to be making a paste out of it. Let's start that. In a small bowl, I am going to start off with mine. I'm gonna go look at this recipe because, again, I don't keep it in my brain. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to put some olive oil, maybe about three tablespoons of olive oil. Here's where you can have some creative, uh, you can keep, uh, okay, you, <laughs> we're still talking about the snow. You can have some creative free freedom with this. What tastes good in uh, a rub for a chicken, for a roast? What tastes good to you? What are the combinations that taste good? I'm going to be using some brown sugar, maybe about half a cup of brown sugar. Uh, I'm going to be putting some thyme. Who doesn't want a little bit of thyme when you're using chicken? And when I say a little bit, that's because I'm just looking at how much chicken I have and I'm getting an idea of how much of this wet rub. You cannot make chicken without rosemary. I'm going to grind that with my fingers because it, this is my own rosemary and it's a little bit coarse. I'm going to be putting in uh, some, some garlic. I didn't mince this myself. Every once in a while I like to use the jarred garlic because it's very loose. It's done for me. I like that it is in uh, an oil that helps the whole rub come together. I'm going to be putting in some paprika. 
And a couple teaspoons of salt, don't be shy on the salt, and a teaspoon of pepper. Now I have this cannel spice. It's a compound spice and you're going to, uh, you're going to know that I don't use compound spices a lot. Any chef will tell you compound, compound spices are great for a home cook who may not be familiar with what goes together. These uh, canal spices were sent to me and they, they're lovely. This one is called uh, Stockholm Lemon and Dill. It's a nice combination. It, yeah, it's nice. It's a, it's a compound spice already done for you. A quick meal, you've got that all ready to go. And now I'm going to put in some lemon juice. Where's my... I don't like that noise because it sounds like I'm going through dirty dishes and I'm not. <laughs> all right, let's put some lemon juice in there because that's going to help us combine this. Ooh, that was quite a bit of lemon. It is lemon season in our grocery stores, so we do have lots of fresh lemon. Let's mix it up and see. Yeah, that's nice. I don't think I need the second lemon half in there. What I have, olive oil. I've got some garlic, thyme, rosemary, paprika, and a little bit of, of dill. And some olive oil. That's what has made this into a paste. I'm going to bring the chicken over and watch what we do. This is a really fresh chicken and I love using that. So I'm going to start putting it, I'm going to separate in here. If you can see in here, I'm going to go underneath the skin and I'm putting it right, look, you can see, hello, I'm inside this chicken and I am going to start putting that right inside the skin. Don't just go on the outside. Where did I get that guy? If you go on the outside of it, that's nice, but that's going to cook off. I go right inside and I put it inside and I rub the meat inside. Let's go on this side. Separate the skin. You can see I'm here. Separate the skin from the meat. This is very wet rub, so go in there. Okay, I'm going to get it into the, into the roasting pan now. <laughs> what? Oh, wow, I thought that was a fan. <laughs> I knew. I'm just glad Bombay's not roasted it. Whoa, sorry. Bombay would have taken this and run. We all know that. I'm going to remove the plastic board that has the chicken yuck on it. That's chef talk for juice. Now let's bring up the pretty version of the uh, roasting pan with the chicken in it. I can continue putting some of this into the skin, but I'm I think I've got quite a bit. I can see it even coming through. I'm now going to just rub it into all the crevices of this spatchcock chicken. It's nicely butterflied. It smells divine. What's the predominant smell I'm getting right now is the garlic. Hmm? Smell you smell nothing over there? You'll, you'll smell it when it's cooking, I'll bet. All right, I'm just going, now, can I, can I marinate this? Yes, you could. I don't need to though, because it just doesn't need it. it, it's good. it is it going to add a lot of depth? Probably not. So I'm making sure that it is fully in there. I'm making sure that it's all around the pan with the oil. I'm gonna rinse my hands and watch what I add to it. I'm going to add now some carrots and some potatoes around this. And that's going to make us a full meal. I did clean these, these carrots before, but I am only going to put them into halves. I'm not going to slice them. I'm not going to do anything more because it's going to take some cooking of this chicken and I don't want the carrots to cook too fast. Let's put all of these carrots around the chicken. Use the overhead to see this. Okay. There we go. So if you've noticed, I've left the carrots sort of whole. You can 
could use just about any vegetable. I saw that beets were on sale too. I thought about using that. And now I've got some potatoes. These have been scrubbed and new potatoes are great for this. I'm going to place them this way down. Didn't know where that other one went. I've got enough here that I'm going to make for a family. Try to make sure that you get some of that rub that's on that in there. So we're still talking about all the things we have coming up. We have Shaylin Farms coming up in March. Lovely family farm in our local area that we will be visiting and learning about. They have multi animals on their farm and they have some produce as well. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, we have a big project in the making and I'm not at liberty to talk about it yet. Keep tuned to this though because you are part of it and that's going to be fun. Am I done? Ah, let's add a little bit of some, another layer of salt and pepper so that the veggies get covered. Let's add some pepper to that. Now if, uh, Bruiser, if you're still here, what have I missed? I do like lots of salt. I've missed something. Oh, this looks lovely though. I mean, raw chicken, you know, nobody likes to look at raw meat, but I, I do like a lot of pepper. All right. What could I add to that? I'm going to add a little bit of more rosemary to it. I just think you can't cook poultry without uh, liberally using rosemary. And I'm going to then drizzle a little bit more olive oil on top of everything because those veggies need that. And can you look at this? Look at this. This is ready for the oven. I'm putting it into a 375 now because I'm a clean freak. I do like to do this. I put a sheet of parchment paper on top of it and that allows air to go through but it stops any splattering in my oven. That's me but I think it's a good idea. So let's put this in the oven. Love this roasting pan, love it. I'm not gonna set a timer for that because as you know, we're gonna use our nose and we're gonna know when that is done. It is getting to the time where I just need to tidy this up and we are going to start assembling our Boston cream pie. Let me go get our cake and see if it has cooled. The uh, yellow cakes have cooled enough, not entirely, but enough. So we are going to put that cake together. Uh, I was talking to a prospective project and one of their concerns were they have watched my stream and that I don't finish dishes. We have a squirrel in our squirrel reader right now that's losing its mind. I wish you could see that. We should turn the camera around. Okay. So uh, this person said, uh, you don't finish dishes. And I'm like, we, we always finish dishes, except they didn't realize, okay, we are about to show you the squirrel eating in our squirrel feeder. Ready? There's squirrel. I have a window. <laughs> I have a window feeder. And it's lovely when the birds, oh, that's all it takes, a little bit of frightening. He will or they will be back in minutes. Thanks for turning our camera around. So I have a squirrel feeder that is meant to be able to watch the birds from the window. And somebody gave that to me when I retired, thinking that I was doing nothing more than sitting and looking at my window in my whimsical way of being retired. The squirrel has not gone far. He's gone on the ledge and he's just waiting until we don't notice and he's coming back to eat all of the bird food. That's okay. Everything needs to eat and we serve everything. We don't mind. Uh, we're going to put our Boston cream pie together. So here we have, I said so. Cute little squirrel. He is cute. Ooh, yummy. It is cute. Little squirrel is cute. 
uh, <laughs> I don't mind feeding them. Everything needs to eat. So you see what these parchment papers do? Boom, right out of the, right out of the pan with not even a thought about it. We set that pan aside and we get out our cooled pastry. So like I was saying, this, uh, this, pro this potential project was saying, will you, will you be finishing dishes? And they didn't realize it was a live stream and not, can, not, you just can't finish all dishes on a live stream unless you do it twice and you bring things back. Assembling cakes is so fun, yes. And this is a simple assembly. Like if you think that Boston cream pie is something beyond you, make it today. You can make, and you could use a cake mix if that really suits you. Although that recipe is pretty simple and we have it up. Uh, all you have to do is make a simple cake mix. The ganache was easy enough. I'm sure those are pantry things you have. You have chocolate maybe, and you have some, some uh, heavy cream. It won't work with table cream. Why easier and better than it? Way easier and better than anything. You're, you got it. All right, I'm going to put this pastry cream, and I have a feeling I've got a lot of pastry cream, but I'm not going to go cheap. Go towards the center. Don't go to the end, as Bruiser will confirm. If you go to the end, you're just, it's all going to just spill out. I think I have a lot of pastry cream here. That's okay. We can use it even as a topping later. So I am putting the pastry cream in the middle. If you see what I have left, what can you use this for? As a topping, I can make, a, it's a, I can make just about anything and use this. All right, that's nice. I don't think I need any more than that. And then I'm going to get the second layer, still a little bit warm, that's okay by me. And I'm, you notice I'm putting this, this side down. It doesn't matter. Situate it on top of that pastry cream. And the part that we all love is the ganache. The ganache is cooled enough. Bruiser saved my life by telling me to put butter in it. Uh, it's kind of thickened by now. Oh, stir it back up. It was really nice when I first made it. It did cool, but uh, let me soften this up a bit. Okay, I am going to put this a uh, ganache. Oh, I know, it, better than any icing. Icing is just all sugar, where this is just chocolate and whipping cream. Delicious. And butter, yeah. Okay, be careful when you're spreading it, because as you can tell, the uh, pastry cream is making the layers shift a bit. And just swirl it. You don't want it, you're not icing this cake, you're not frosting it, you're not making it go all the way out. Oop, lost my layer. And there you go. Look at that. So I do have some pastry cream. I would just swoop that to make it a little tidy. Uh, the yellow cakes are a little warm, so it's going to spill out, but that is still going to be delicious. So I have Boston cream pie. I have a batch cock chicken. I mean, you could even sprinkle some ground nuts on that. It's not part of this recipe. This alone is going to be enough. Some of the uh, pastry cream went on the side of it. That's okay. I have some pastry cream and some ganache left. That's not going to waste. I'm going to use that. So the spatchcock, I said so again, but I was pretty good about it today. Couple Mexican chefs and learning what brings them to uh, cook in a little town like Peterborough. We're going to be showing you around that restaurant. Fun. Thank you to everybody who showed up. Speakeasy Channel, uh, Little Miss Erin, Dana's Kitchen, Texas Cryptid, everybody, Bruiser, everybody who was here. Uh, Leafy Garnish, if you're here, thank you for showing up today. You shared the Sunday with us and we enjoyed that. In the meantime, keep cooking. Keep nourishing yourself and nourish those you love. But for now, this kitchen is closed, but we're going to raid.